The appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Institute of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, and as ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Member of the, members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meetings are recorded and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA web, web page. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Here. Um, Ms. Winter? Here. Mr. Cochran? Here. Also attending tonight's public hearing is Maureen Pollock and uh, Dave Cody, building inspector with the town. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, and convenience and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing. The first item is at ZBA FY 2022-12. Pamela Thornton, representing by Thomas R. Reedy, Esquire, requests a variance to allow the subdivision of a parcel of land containing two dwellings so that each existing dwelling will exist on its own lot and two dimensional requirements of Article 6, Table 3, Dimensional Regulations, Section 6.1, 6.4 of the Zoning Bylaw, pursuant to Section 10 of the Zoning Bylaw, and 40A of the Massachusetts General Laws. Located at 103 Pelham Road, Map 15A, Parcel 64, and property identified as Pelham Road, Map 15A, Parcel 92, Neighborhood Residence, RN Zoning District. ZBA FY 2022-13, Nanatonis Family Trust requests a special permit in order to allow a flag lot under section 3.2832 3 
6.3 and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 82 Pomeroy, 82 Pomeroy Lane, Map 20C, Parcel 150, Neighborhood Residents RN and Low Density Residents RLD slash Farmland Conservancy, excuse me, Conservation Overlay FC Zoning Districts and ZBA FY 2022-14, Joel Greenberg requests a special permit to allow the construction of a non-owner occupied duplex as a complementary principal use to the existing one family detached dwelling under section 3.01, 3.3211, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 77 North Whitney Street, map 14B, parcel 98, General Residence RG Zoning District. Following those matters, there'll be an opportunity for public comment on any matter not before the board tonight and any other business not anticipated within, the, within 48 hours. Tonight, the first application will be heard by a panel consisting of myself, Ms. Parks, Mr. Maxfield, Mr. Meadows, and Mr. Gilbert. The second application will be heard by a panel chaired by Mr. Maxfield, and consisting of Ms. Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Gilbert, and Ms. Winter. The third application will be heard by a panel chaired by Mr. Maxfield and consisting of Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows, Mr. Gilbert, and Mr. Cochran. The first order of business tonight is ZBA FY 2022-12, Pamela Thornton, represented by Thomas R. Reedy, Esquire, requests at variance to allow the subdivision of a parcel of land containing two dwellings so that each dwelling unit will exist on its own lot and to dimensional requirements of Article 6, Table 3, Dimensional Regulations, Section 6.1, 6.4 of the Zoning Bylaw, pursuant to Section 10 of the Zoning Bylaw and 40A of the Massachusetts General Laws, located at 103 Pelham Road, Map 15A, Parcel 64, and a property identified as Pelham Road, Map 15A, Parcel 92, neighborhood residents are in zoning districts. Are there any disclosures? If not, I'll summarize the site visit we had on June 7th. Uh, we arrived at the property. Uh, we walked the property lines. We observed both the uh, both existing uh, structures. We went, uh, we talked to the current residents um, and learned their desire to split, uh, for the reason that they wish to split the, uh, the property up to each have separate lots. Um, we went to the uh, back of the property and saw the property line, observed the parking arrangements um, in front of the um, uh, garage and, and by the, the house in the back. And we also looked at the, the property, uh, the setbacks and the distance from the property line to the, um, the structures. Um, does anybody else have anything that we also met with the um, with uh, somebody from the law firm representing Mrs. Thornton. Is there any other um, ob observations or comments members would like to make about the board uh, site visit? Okay, um, let me summarize this applicants, the submissions we've received so far. We, a ZBA uh, application from the applicant, we've received an application, a variance narrative, and a subdivision approval not required plan of land. Uh, made by K Kathleen Courtright and prepared by Daniel uh, Randall Iser, dated January 26th, 2022. Uh, the applicant has waiver requests from plan requirements for a building plan, a management plan, a landscape plan, lighting plan, sign plan, and soil erosion and traffic statement. Uh, planning staff submissions include an existing conditions map showing the existing parcel lines for both, um, both um, lots, Project application report dated June 6th, also one dated June 7th, and comments from the town engineer in the email dated June 1st, 2020. I think that's all the um, submissions. Is it not, Maureen? Did uh, I, I need to provide a minor update to the report and email the copy to the board. Um, oh, that, we can cover that later. It was just a couple uh, minor things. Dealing with the um, 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 access. access and easements. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, uh, Mr. Reedy, are you representing the applicant? I am, Mr. Chair. All right, it's good to see you. Introduce yourself for the record. 
course, uh, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst here on behalf of the applicant, essentially the Thornton family and their petition for a variance from certain dimensional uh, requirements, as the chairman had noted and is more fully laid out in the project, in the application. And then I think Ms. Pollock's wonderfully written project application report. Um, with that, hopefully this is a pretty simple one. So, you know, as everybody saw on the site visit, this is a property that's on Pelham Road. The, the front house was constructed in 1900. The rear house was constructed in 1950. It's been owned by the family. Um, there is a provision under what's Master General Laws Chapter 41, Section 81L that allows the division of the light, the, the parcel, because these houses predate uh, the subdivision control law in the town of Amherst. Um, but it doesn't rectify zoning issues. And so in talking with the family, because ultimately the idea is to sell off the rear structure and for one of the siblings to, to retain that front structure um, in order to do that and to have compliant, even though we're going to get a variance, houses, we, we need a variance. And so you know, maybe the best thing to do is I can share my screen just to show the survey plan. So if you can all see my screen, we've got, here we go, you've got the entirety of the lots. And so there is this second parcel that's part of the deed, but it's going to be combined with this lot two. And you've got lot one here with the existing house from the from 1900. You've got this lot two with the existing house from 1950. We've proposed the division line here and here. This is the singular driveway that will be used to access both of the properties. You've got a paved driveway here and paved driveway here. This is where that um, access easement would be to allow the owner of lot one to enter over the lot two and then back onto their lot. We're also aware of the uh, separate uh, utilities that the town engineer is going to require, and that that's fine as a condition. But as you'll see, when we when we drew the lot lines, there are some um, non-compliant parts, uh, building circle on both of them, um, and there's a there's a host of others, and I'm happy to go through them. And that might be the best thing to do. So, minimum lot area. Uh, 20,000 square feet is required in this zoning district. Neither of them, as you see, has 20,000 square feet of lot area. Uh, lot frontage is 120 feet. As you'll see, neither of them, you know, we have 60.73 and 16.07. Neither of them comply with the, the lot frontage. Building area circle, as I mentioned, so that's where you have to equal the lot frontage of 120 feet. Um, neither of them, because of the width, you know, in total, it's about 76 feet in width. So neither of them comply. Uh, front setback, we do comply. So there's a check in our favor. Um, side and rear yard setback, as you can see, um, that's a 15 foot side and rear yard setback. And as far as the side setback goes, you know, you've got 14 feet here for the shed. You've got nine feet here and you've got, I think, two feet here. So we're requesting um, uh, a variance from those. Side setback for the accessory structures. And so this really is for the, the sheds. And so that's where we get the 9.5 and the 3.3 feet um, where those aren't compliant. Uh, lot coverage. So we've got 30% lot coverage. And as you'll see on, on this side, the total lot coverage they will both exceed um, what the requirements are, but for building coverage, we do comply. And so it's, I, I'd say they're all dimensional variance requests. It's more technical than anything else. It's to allow these structures to remain as they have been since at least, you know, 1950 um, and to allow the, the plan to be endorsed by the planning board. Uh, the applicants are aware that any subsequent changes would also require variances. So if they wanted to do something else to the houses, they would require variances. Uh, and one thing I'll note is if you look literally next door, 
you've got something very, a very similar setup, just two houses that I think had existed for quite some time. And I would imagine ours has exi have existed for, for longer. So that's, that's really the request. Um, we think that the board has the authority to, to grant this. Uh, and so what we would ask is for that variance to be granted. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Um, it seems to me that this is really a, a case where we're um, allowing the splitting of a lot on, with, that contains some pre-existing non-conforming structures, many of which are, one of which is 120 years old, one another one is uh, 70 years old. Uh, and that is the reason, and they exist with, they, they were existing prior to the, um, the uh, dimensional requirements being imposed. Um, and this is really a, a case where we're trying to um, allow the splitting of a large lot to allow two separate structures and sale of the house, uh, each separate unit. Um, seems to me it's, this is, app, this is appropriate, uh, but I would like to open that up to questions from any board members if they have any. Ms. Parks. I guess I'm just curious um, about the line um, not of the of the lot one not including that shed. Was there a reason for not wanting to pull it back to where that the line of the shed is? Yeah, it was a family decision. Okay. Um, so it, it just how they wanted to if I may continue your question, Ms. Parks, it's just how they wanted to split up the, the land, the property. Okay. Any other questions? Not. Um, I don't have a question. Yep. It's Mr. Just a little concerning to see a, a, a 5,000 some odd square foot lot. Yeah. House. And uh, I, I'm just wondering if this has any, any indication of a precedent. Well, no. Um, our, it shouldn't, the board doesn't hold on precedent, doesn't act on precedent, doesn't recognize it. Um, it's, and this doesn't, we don't set precedential de decisions based on um, each separate decision. So there shouldn't be a precedent set by this. I think this is really, I understand your concern and I share it, it looks very small and we hope there aren't a lot of 5,000 uh, square foot lots in town, but this really is, I think a reflection of the existing conditions that have, um, existed in this case for a long time. Um, but I, I don't think this is something that is a, 5,000 square foot lots aren't something that I think the town would benefit from on a regular basis. And I'm, I, I would not be in favor of approving lots of 5,000 square foot lots. Is there a way that the family could uh, perhaps enlarge that to include the shed that was indicated um, I know it's, it, this is a family decision and they're making a decision based upon how they feel now, but th those lots are not always going to be in the family's possession. Um, yeah, I mean, I think from a practical concern, if you look at where the parking for um, that lot two would be, I'll pull it back up so you can see, you know, this is, this is that larger area where I think uh, function, there you go, hopefully you can see it now. This is that larger area where I think functionally the, the parking would exist. Um, and I'll say we've had several conversations with the family. We've, we've talked about a lot of different iterations here and there are four siblings and this is the plan that they've approved. Without going into too much. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Make a quick comment. Um, you know, I agree with the concern, uh, you know, uh, just on the basis of the lot square footage, but taking a look at the unique nature of the site, um, you know, I think the right move is what you're suggesting here. Um, I think it is to basically provide the parking for the rear unit as, as is in front of the shed which uh, you know, would complicate matters if you tried to incorporate that into the front parcel. Additionally, that dimension is so minimal. It's like 60 feet, I think, by you know, 20 or 30 feet, something like that. 
you're only going to be grabbing a couple hundred square feet. You know, the 5,000 square foot issue still exists, but, you know, given the sort of circumstance of this site and the age of these buildings, I personally don't see this to be a problem. Mr. Maxfield, I saw your hand. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I think we all are on the same page that we don't love the idea of 5,000 square foot lots, but where this really seems to me just kind of, um, I don't know, almost kind of bureaucratic wrangling where there's no change on any of the buildings or the property. You know, I'm inclined to uh, to approve this lot kind of as is. They, um, you know, they, they've got the, the property, I'm sure, down the line when somebody wants to make any uh, changes to it. Uh, they're going to find that difficult, but you you know what you're getting into. Where at this time, no changes are being made. So yeah, I'm in in support of approving. Other comments before we go to public comment. Questions. All right. Are there any are there public comments, Maureen? Do we have anybody from the public who wishes to speak to this matter? Um. No, if any members of the public wish to speak, they need to raise, press the raise your hand feature. I'm not seeing anyone raising their hand. All right. Um, if there are no further questions, I would entertain a motion. Uh, I would ask if the board has any other questions, and I don't think they do. If not, I would entertain a motion to open the public meeting on this application while keeping the public hearing open in case we have to solicit additional information. Do I have a motion? Mr. Maxfield, is there a second? Second. Ms. Parks, um, this requires, is there any discussion of the motion? If not, this requires a roll call vote. I vote aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Uh, the motion passes five to nothing. Um, I now open the public meeting on this application. This is the time when the board can discuss the matter, approve comment, approve conditions, if any, and considers whether the board should make the findings required under the bylaw and chapter 40A to approve a variance. Um, as you know, this is an application for a variance. This variances are not something we see very often. I think I've seen, you know, four of them, three or four of them in my time on the board. And in order to grant a, a variance, we essentially have to make three findings. We have to find that the structures, um, is, that there are circumstances specifically relating to soil shape in this case, or topography, number one, which would, um, and these, conditions, uh, if not dealt with, would create a hardship um, and either financial, uh, substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or the applicant, and the desirable relief does not um, work to the detriment, detriment of the public good. So essentially, we have to find that this is unique, that this is, it would be harmful or to the individual, to the applicant if this variance wasn't granted, and that it doesn't provide for precedent or doesn't provide for, um, uh, it doesn't go against the, the zoning the um, zoning bylaw or the uh, town plan. Um, are there any comments uh, beyond what we've already heard about the, and, and we can repeat those comments, but beyond what we've already heard from the, um, from the board? I think, it's, um, there are conditions that have been suggested by the staff. I think those conditions are all um, reasonable and I think they're acceptable to the applicant. Um, I'm gonna read through those conditions and um, Maureen, if I get the easement condition wrong, will you correct me? All right, uh, but we'll operate off the latest easement condition that you sent out if, in case I mis, uh, misread it because I'm not at home. The first condition is a standard condition that the project shall be maintained in accordance with the approved plans and application packages. Any change will be reviewed by the building commissioner to determine if submission to the Zoning Board of Appeals is necessary. Said changes may be reviewed and or approved by the Zoning Board of Appeal at a public meeting or the change or changes are significant enough to require a formal modification of the permit and or condition. The approved, plan shall in, the approved plan includes subdivision approval not required plan of land 
created by Kathleen Courtright and prepared by Randall Iser, dated January 26, 2020. That's the plans that need to be met. Two, all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be selected according to dark sky compliance recommendations of the ZBA rules and regulations. Three, any dwelling unit on the premises being rented shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the residential rental bylaw. The street numbers for both existing dwellings shall be clearly marked with reflective signage and be visible from the public right away from both directions. That would be an improvement because I had a hard time finding, I drove right past the property. So um, I can see why that's needed. Five, parking shall occur on improved surfaces only. The parking area shall be maintained as needed. The parking drive areas shall be constructed in accordance with the requirements of Article 7.1. There are two conditions based on comments received from the town engineer. Um, there needs to be a completely separate water and sewer services connecting to each dwell, existing dwelling unit that shall be located on the premises. The said water and sewer services shall be shown on an undated plan. The, uh, no, excuse me, an updated, not undated, updated plan. The updated plan, which will amend the plan that, um, of January 26th, shall be submitted to the planning department within, uh, we have an undetermined number of days. And I'd ask the petitioner uh, how many days or how many months uh, they have, it will take them to get that plan with the knowledge that the variance is only good for a year. So it has to be uh, fairly quickly. Um, is there any thought on that? Yeah, I'd say uh, I updated the report earlier today um, for the last two conditions that said that would change it. Uh, the last part would be upon transfer of one of the said lots. Well, upon transfer, okay. So it gives them time, but you know. That's acceptable, yeah. And an incentive. <laughs> so, got it. So they can't they can't transfer the lots until this until this is done. All right, that makes sense. On the seventh condition, uh, utility easements shall be provided for the completely separate water and sewer services connecting to each existing dwelling unit located on the premises. Said utility easements shall be recorded by the with the Hampshire District Registry of Deeds. A copy of the said recorded utility assessment shall be provided to the planning department. And I expect we have the same language regarding upon, um, as you did in the, in the previous, okay, in the previous condition, so upon transfer. All right. Are there any other conditions or? Yeah, uh, I added, uh, so today I uh, updated the report um, for uh, to add one more condition and it says, uh, unimpeded access from lot two to lot one shall be provided across an easement at least 12 feet wide, the said easement shall be recorded with the Hampshire District Registry of Deeds and a copy shall be provided to the planning department upon transfer of one of the said lots. Okay, so that, that just simply allows the owner of the back lot to cross the property to get, cross the front lot to get back there. Is that correct? Re reverse it, the front lot, because they're accessing over that. Over the, gotcha. Right, but yes. That's the idea. The pipe stem through the pipe stem. Okay. Are there any other uh, conditions suggested by the board? All right. I would entertain a, no a motion that we approve the conditions as listed in the draft pro project application report as amended by our um, conversation tonight. Do I have a motion? This is just on the conditions. We have to yet find. The, make the findings under the variance to approve this, the whole application, but this is just on the conditions. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, discussion? If not, it's a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Maxfield? Aye. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Uh, lastly, we have to make findings in order to approve a variance. To read those findings directly from in the abridged version of chapter 48. I'm not going to read all of that, but the permit granting authority shall have the power to grant an appeal upon appeal or upon petition with respect to a particular land or structures a variance from the terms of the applicable zoning ordinance or bylaw 
where such permit granting authority specifically finds that owning to circumstances relating to the soil, shape, or topography of such land or structures, and especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located, a literal enforcement of the provisions of the ordinance or bylaw would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or the appellant, and that desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purposes of such ordinance or bylaw. In this case, I think the controlling notion is that the shape of this property is, um, meets the first criteria. The second would be that it would be a financial hardship to require the change in the, in the, in the location of the buildings in order to split the lot. And the third is that this, is, this relief does not uh, work to the detriment of the, 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 um, the neighborhood or to the detriment of the, or against the public, uh, our bylaws because it's in some cases 120 year old uh, structures or 70 year old structures, and it wouldn't change the existing uh, conditions. Um, so for those reasons, I would move, I would entertain a motion that we find the, um, we make those three findings consistent with chapter, section 10 of the Massachusetts chapter laws in order to approve a waiver. Do I have a motion to do so? A move. A second. Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? If not, um, I would. Uh, we have a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Axfield? Aye. Meadows? Aye. Gilbert? Aye. So we have approved the conditions. We've met the cr criteria of the variance. I do not think we have to vote again on granting the variance. We've done all that. So um, congratulations, you've been granted a waiver uh, and you have dimensional from the dimensional requirements and you've got to get that water and sewer stuff done and the uh, easement done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm gonna turn the meeting over to Mr. Maxfield, who's gonna chair the next two applications and I'm gonna be off uh, for my trip. So uh, good luck, <laughs> see you all, and I'll see you when I get back. Have fun. See you soon, enjoy. We're gonna start it, I'm Dylan Maxfield. Um, I... I'll go ahead and introduce this. Um, Maureen, if I'm getting anything wrong procedurally, just let me know to kind of walk through this here. Um, the next we're going to be moving on to it's ZBA FY 2022 uh Nenartonis Family Trust request a special permit in order to allow a flag lot under section 3.2832, uh, 6.3, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 82 Pomeroy Lane, map 20C, parcel 150, neighborhood residence RN and low density residence uh, RLD, farmland conservation overlay, FC zoning districts. Members sitting for this will be myself, uh, Ms. Parks, Mr. Meadows, uh, Mr. Gilbert, and Ms. Winter. Um, we've received following submissions for this one we we'll received the 2021 aerial imagery map uh, comments from the town engineer the project application report and the special permit uh, application packet is that everything we've received yes uh, excellent all right um who is going to be presenting for this uh, application yours truly mr chair all right, uh, Mr. Reedy, if you can get us started, uh, if you want to just introduce yourself one more time for the start of this application. Yeah, of course. For the record, Tom Reedy, an attorney with Bacon, Wilson, and Amherst here on behalf of the Nanotonis family in their application for a flag lot special permit for 82 Pomeroy Lane in Amherst. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about the site visit, and then I can hop into the presentation. Yes, that's right. We did do that site visit at the site visit. Um, you were unable to access the property itself due to the um, overgrown pathway leading to it. There was a large amount of poison ivy that we decided we'd 
best not go through. So we'd walk the dimensions of the property along the sidewalk to get a sense of um, how large the property would be. The one of the questions asked was, we know the, um, the size of the house that was going to be built, that we had that footprint um, was, and that was, I think, really the only, only question we had at the time. Um, were there any others that I'm missing? All right, that's what of you, Mr. Reedy. Okay, thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so maybe what I'll do is just to orient everyone to where we're actually talking about, I'll share my screen. So you can see the property. It's this flag lot that's already been carved out through uh, through an ANR. Um, and so I think you know, I actually drove drove by as some of you were there, and I know you were standing here. And this is that path that was overgrown with poison ivy and probably ticks. So you're probably pretty wise not to have gone back there. Um, in this Amherst aerial imagery version you will not see there is a house here 90 i think if i go back to property map you'll see that it shows up there one of the things to note is the distance from the back of that house to the property line looks to be about 162 feet and then um on another plan that i'll show you you'll see that the the proposed footprint for the new house is 50 feet back so we're talking about over 210 feet it looks like from the back of this existing house to where the new house uh, behind it will be sited. One thing to note is this is about 125 feet. So just next door, there's a flag lot, there's a single family home along the road. It's 125 feet uh, back there. And so this is Pomeroy Lane. To your left is west, to your east, uh, sorry, to your right is east, north and south. And so this is, as I'll show on the next plan, this is about the area that they're looking to put the house in. So I'll stop sharing that screen and then I will pull up a site plan. And what you should see here is the site plan. So again, you'll see here's the outline of the lot if you follow the cursor here, down, down, and then down here. This is the area that was overgrown so you couldn't get in. This is about the area where that new um, house is at, at 90. And you can see the house size, the approximate house size is tucked back about 1,780 square feet, square foot footprint. And this is a dimension of 50, five zero. So that's where I say, you know, from the back here, so the property line is 160 and then from 160, uh, further is, you know, about 210 feet from the back of the building back, uh, back to here. So we've been through the Conservation Commission. We've got uh, order of conditions. You'll see the wetlands have been delineated. You'll see the uh, buffer zone. So the 50 foot buffer zone. So they're staying outside of that residential buffer zone. Again, you've got the wetlands over here, wetlands over here. So this is, there's a lot of wetlands on this side. So that house is really tucked in here nicely. And one of the things you know, for you to know, um, even though these are all offsite, nothing's going to happen in them, right? It's their their wetlands, their wildlife habitat. They uh, help ecologically. So, where this house is sited is really where that house is is going to be sited. And so, then I'll stop sharing this screen and I'll share one more screen, just because uh, part of the discussion we always have with flag lots is about the entrance driveway and making sure we comply with the entrance driveway. So I've got. Hopefully you can see this last screen. So what we have here is really the entrance about a hundred feet in showing um, what we would have for drainage controls. And so this has been done by Proterra and Stamped. Um, you'll see it's a, if you're out there, it's a relatively flat site. We don't have any huge grade changes. I think your slope is 2.14%. Uh, of the of the drainage. And then if you look at what you're talking about for the roadway, you start up here at about 165 feet. And then you travel quite a ways, you get 164 feet, 163, 162. So that's three feet over 100 feet. So you've got a very slight um, grade heading towards the back. And in this one, you can see a little bit better. This is a blow up of what we have here. You can see how, you know, beyond this, because this is really what the town's concerned about, you know, 
um, the driveway will extend back into this house area. Over here is the slope. So you can see from a, like a profile perspective of what that driveway does. It actually, you know, it, it drops off. So roadway here at 165, and then you, you head back. And so you're actually, you know, it's down 2%, it's down 4%, it's down 2.5% um, as you travel away from the public way. Then you've also got the erosion control plan just to ensure that during construction, you know, you got your construction entrance here um, so that you're not tracking anything, you know, any mud, et cetera, onto the, the public way. So, you know, I'd like to say uh, just like that last one, this hopefully is a, is a pretty simple one um, as well. It's a, it's a flag lot that's allowed in the zoning district. It's for a single family home. Um, there's sufficient lot area. I know uh, Ms. Pollock's again, her, her wonderfully crafted project application report lays out all of that um, information, but that it is com completely compliant. So with that, you know, we'd, we'd ask for special permit approval. Thank you, Mr. Reed. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to ask, maybe it was in here, maybe I missed it. The um, the driveway that's going to be, I assume, an asphalt driveway or is it a gravel driveway? I didn't, I didn't see that anywhere in here. Do we know what they're planning on making that? Yeah, let me look a little closer to see if I can. It's a gravel drive, twelve foot wide gravel drive is what they're proposing. Okay, and then my other question was with that new house there. Um, on that other lot, was there any uh, proposed screening of what was going to be to to separate those two, or is that going to be open? Yeah, I don't. I mean, that's a, a little down the road. Um, I would imagine so. When I drove by on on my way today, there is some existing vegetation to the rear of um, ninety that would, I think, affect that that appears to be on ninety's property that would effectively buffer it. And I would imagine. You know, frankly, I look at the, the property just to the west of there and there's like right in each other's backyard, which I can't imagine being a very good condition or, or marketable or sellable condition. So um, I haven't seen plans showing retention of vegetation, but I think we would accept a condition that says, you know, retention of existing vegetation to the greatest extent possible to allow, um, you know, screening between the rear of 90 and, and, and 82. I think that's fine. Um, and then I just want to be a little bit more clear for the first 20 feet, you know, from the, and I'll probably, I'll share my screen so you can see it just with the driveway. Um, if you can see, this is paved up here. So it's the first 20 feet and it's the apron as is required. So we've got paved here and then this turns into gravel as we go further back. So, you know, paved where it needs to be and then gravel for the balance. Uh, questions from other board members. Hearing none, I'm going to go ahead and open it up to uh, public comment. I see a uh, hand raised from a uh, Jose Ramos. Jose, you should be. I, Hello. If you could state your name, name and your address. Jose Ramos, Nadi Pomeroy Lane. Nope. I, I just got a quick question uh, because I know that when I built my house, uh, there is an easement that goes from my neighbor to my right through my property and underneath that so-called driveway that, that's being built. I'm just curious about that. It's for drainage. So without, if I could, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. Um, so I, I haven't done the title exam on this, but assuming what you're saying, and I have no reason to doubt what you're saying yeah. exists, that would be maintained. So there's okay. if there's a drainage easement that burdens this property, then the they would be considered the servient estate. And so they would be required to maintain uh, functional drainage across that property. All right. All right. Cool. That was my question. Thanks. Uh, questions, comments, any other um, public comment on this matter? Uh, 
Right. Uh, hearing none, um, I'm going to go ahead and so I want to move uh, that we open the public meeting portion. Correct. Well, um, Mr. Chair, you can, you can just keep the public hearing open and, and you don't need to make a motion to um, open the public meeting. That's unnecessary. You can hold off closing the public hearing when you're making the motion to approve with conditions, if that's what you're intending to do today. Uh, yeah, do we, does the board feel it has sufficient information here to move forward on this? I feel relatively comfortable on this one. It seems to be pretty straightforward. So we wanna go ahead and open the public meeting portion about that. Am I correct about that, Maureen? Again, you don't you don't need to, you can just continue as 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 you are. You don't need to make a motion. Uh, so the public hearing is open. So this gives you opportunity that if you, when you're going through your findings and uh, you realized, oh, you might have more questions for the applicant or you would like to hear from the public, it gives you opportunity to engage a bit more. So you may just hold off uh, making a motion to close the public hearing when you're ready to make a motion to make your decision. Got it. Well, all right then. Uh, so we wanna go ahead and start making uh, specific findings. Am I correct about that? Correct, yeah. So you could start with section 6.3 for the flag lot. Pull that up here. Can I ask you a quick question? Absolutely. Um, did we hear, uh, was there any um, thing from any of Butters? Uh, th uh, there were no um, emails or phone calls um, uh, taken uh, regarding this application. Thanks. But I, I will note that, uh, so there was a legal ad that was placed uh, twice leading up to this meeting in the Daily Hampshire Gazette. So today is the 9th. Uh, so let's see here. So there was a legal ad that was published in the paper on May 26th and on June 2nd. And uh, there was um, public hearing notices that were provided to the abutters that uh, own properties within 300 feet of the property. And that went out um, a few weeks ago, mailed out. And that, um, that answer your question, Ms. Parks? Beautiful. All right, um, so I'm just gonna go through here. Should I just read through the, um, the zoning bylaw review here? Sure. Cool. So that's gonna be for 6.32, the area of each flag lot uh, exclusive of access strips shall be at least double the minimum lot area normally required for that district, except in a cluster subdivision, in which case it shall be at least double the minimum lot area required for a cluster lot in that district, in the FC district, the area of flag lots shall be as provided for in sections 3.2832, 4.3281, and 4.3282. Uh, so for 3.2832, for flag lots with frontage located outside the FC district and a majority of lot area within the FC district, Lot area requirements for these are as follows. Minimum lot area, 20,000 feet with a maximum lot area of 30,000 feet. Um, we find that this uh, lot has roughly about 30,000 square feet. So it meets the um, requirements for sections 6.32 and 3.2832 under the zoning bylaw. Um, 6.33, uh, see here. Should I read through the no, whole? No, I don't think that's necessary. Um, um, find any of this here, and we just want to move to specific findings then in ten point three eight. Sure. Cool. And that the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed, and/or the total um, total town is determined appropriate by the special permit granting authority. Proposal is compatible with existing uses and uses permitted by right in the same district. Um, use of the flag lock is allowed in the special permit um, with a special permit in the RN and RLD FC zoning districts. Um, with conditions placed under the approval, with approved order conditions made by the Conservation Commission and the approved special permit made by the Zoning Board of Appeals, the flag lot will be compatible 
within its environment and neighborhood uh, for 10.382, 10.383, and 10.385, and 10.387. Um, the flag lot is flag lot and subsequent construction of a single family home will not constitute a nuisance or be detrimental to the community. Adequate setting for the building has been identified. Uh, 10.384 adequate and appropriate facilities would be provided for the proper operation of the proposed use. Um, before any issuance of building permits, the application shall obtain sewer, water, driveway, and trench permits from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Um, Proposal ensures that it is in conformance with the parking and sign regulations of this bylaw. Um, we have not received a plan to relative to the construction of a single family home. Therefore, 10.386 and respectable Article 7 is not applicable under this permit. Uh, 10.387 proposal provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian movement within the site. Uh, and in relation to adjacent streets, property, or improvements, special permit granting authority deems the proposal uh, likely to have significantly adverse impacts on traffic patterns. It shall uh, be permitted to require a traffic impact report. Um, the use of this is we do not expect this to generate um, excessive amounts of traffic, so that is not applicable. Uh, 10.388 proposal ensures adequate space for off-street loading and unloading of vehicle goods, products, materials, and equipment um, incidental to normal operation of the establishment or use. Uh, it's not applicable to this project. 10.389, the proposal provides adequate methods of disposal and or uh, storage for sewage, refuse, recyclables, and other waste resulting from the uses uh, permitted and permissible on the site, methods of drainage for surface water. For the issuance of any building permit, the applicant shall obtain sewer, water, driveway, and trench permits from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Uh, 10.390. Proposal ensures protection from flood uh, hazards as stated in sections 3.228, considering such factors as elevation, buildings, drainage, adequacy of sewer disposal, erosion, sedimental control, equipment location, uh, refuse disposal, storage of buoyant materials, extent of paving, effect of the fill, roadways, and other encroachments on flood runoff and flow, storage of chemicals and other hazardous substance. Uh, property is not in a flood zone, will not increase the potential for flooding since measures have been taken to decrease the amount of runoff onto adjacent properties. Uh, the proposal protects to the extent feasible, unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features. Uh, the finding is not applicable to this project. 10 point 392, the proposal provides adequate landscaping, including the screening of adjacent residential uses, provision of uh, street trees, landscaping islands, landscape islands in the parking lot, and a landscape buffer along the street frontage when a non residential use adjoins. Um, let me skip the non residential use part here. Staff review we have in here properties well vegetated with conditions placed under the approved order of conditions made by the Conservation Commission and the approval of special permit made by the Zoning Board of Appeals. The flag lot will be compatible uh, within its environment and neighborhood. 10.393 proposal provides uh, protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, including parking, exterior lighting, use of cutoffs, luminaries, light shields, lower uh, screening, similar sources. Maureen, do I need to read the full context of each of these, or can I just go into it in our review here? We're going to be here a minute. No, yeah, you can you can just you know summarize um, the staff review. Sure. Um, if there's any key sentences that you want to capture from any of this sections, that's fine. But you, I don't feel like it's necessary that you need to read verbatim those sections. Yeah, yeah. Just go right into it. So yeah, condition has been included to require that all exterior lighting be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. Uh, 10.394, proposal avoids uh, to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. A town engineer has reviewed the application and has no issues with proposal grading and drainage method. Um, uh, proposal for 10.395 uh, is not applicable to the proposal. 10.396, uh, not applicable to the project. Um, 
uh, 10.397 proposal provides adequate recreational facilities, open space and amenities for the proposed use. Aerial mapping shows that the majority of the lot is found to be open space, which appears to be adequate for a residential lot. And lastly, 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and the goals of the master plan. Uh, flag lot is compatible with the master plan as the property is located within the outlying areas of town. The board needs to determine whether the proposal meets section uh, 3.2832, 6.3, and 10.38 under the zoning bylaw. Um, now, for this part here, we uh, we would take a vote on whether or not we can make these findings so uh, with a uh, meeting of conditions. Am I correct? That's how we want to propose that? Uh, sure. You, you could also, um, another way of going about it is you could actually just do one motion uh, to approve the the application under section 3.2832 and 6.3 and 10.38 under the zoning bylaw with conditions as stated in um, the project application report dated June 9th, 2022. Then after that, we'd be all set. Am I correct on that? Correct. All right, and that case, and the last thing I want to do is just quickly go through these conditions so that way they are in the uh, public record here. Uh, the project shall be built and maintained according to the approved uh, plans and application package. Um, any changes to be reviewed by the building commissioner determining if submission zoning, so on and so forth in there. Um, what these plans include is our special permit application, our management plan, a project narrative prepared by attorney Reedy, um, orders and conditions. Um, Subdivision approval not required. Uh, our site plan, and we have our plan profile details signed and stamped. Uh, all in there. Number two, all exterior lighting shall be uh, designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast as to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be selected according to the dark side compliance recommendations of the ZBA rules and regulations. Uh, the number uh, number three. The street number for both dwellings shall be clearly marked with reflective signage and be visible uh, from the public right of way from both directions. Number four, unimpeded access shall be provided uh, across either the access strip or the easement as at 50 feet wide. And number five, before the issuance of any building permits, the applicant shall obtain sewer, water, uh, driveway, and trench permits from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Number six, uh, the vegetated drainage swell shall be maintained and in good condition. Number seven, parking shall occur on improved surfaces only. The parking area shall be maintained as needed, and the parking in the drive area shall be constructed in, in accordance with requirements for Article 7.1. Um, are there any other conditions that we would want to impose, or does that all sound good? I would just say on for, for us, uh, condition number three, street numbers for the dwelling. Hmm. So the dwelling. Yep. Okay. Um, then uh, I would entertain a motion that we uh, approve uh, or we make our findings and approve the application with the one amendment in condition number three uh, for both dwellings to simply say the dwelling. That'll sound good. I have a motion. I have a quick. Um, do we want to say? Do we say something in there about um, keeping as much vegetation for screening as possible? We talked about that being a, a condition. I don't necessarily uh, feel we have to. Okay. We want to though. So, Ms. Yeah. Parks, if I could just respond to that. So it looks like I just pulled up Mass Mapper, and I don't know if Maureen, if you've got it, but it looks like, yeah. and I might be able to share my screen here to show you. Um, if you see 82, so this is just a mass GIS system. It used to be called Oliver. Now it's called Mass Mapper. This is 82 Pomeroy. This is 90. This is an old shed that no longer exists there. You can see this is meadow really back here. And so existing vegetation is really on the 90 property. And so if, if my opinion would be if they, they know what's going back here, if they take the vegetation down, they know what they're going to see. And there's not a ton of vegetation that exists on 82 because of its stature as a as a meadow so um what about the property on the other side let me see if i can 
over here. Yeah. It looks like it looks like there's vegetation here. And then I think these are all wetlands. If I could figure out how to get back to. So let me share my screen again. So you'll see over here, you've got mapped wetlands and then they stop about where the property line is. They don't go beyond, but my suspicion is that those wetlands probably extend beyond, but right in here, and I'll, I can zoom in a little bit, you'll see those, what the, this is the wetland line. So there are wetlands all in this area over here. So they, you, they can't do anything in there. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, we, uh, do we have any other conditions that we want to oppose? Or are we okay with the ones listed here? If so, I'd, uh, yeah, again, I'd entertain a motion to uh, make the findings, uh, the necessary findings, um, and approve the project with conditions stated in the uh, project application report with the um, one amendment to condition three to change for both dwellings to for the dwelling. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Uh, Ms. Parks moves. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Meadows seconds. Uh, we have a motion. Is there any discussion of the motion? Hearing none, I'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, chair votes aye. Uh, Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Uh, Mr. Gilbert? Aye. And Mr. Winner? Or, I'm sorry, aye. Ms. Uh, excellent. The motion is approved five to zero. Um, yeah, congratulations. Thank you very much. As always, good seeing you. Thanks so much for your work tonight. See you soon. Have a good one. All right. Next on the agenda, we have ZBA FY 2022-14 Joel Greenbaum request a special permit to allow the construction of a non-owner occupied duplex as a complementary principal use to the existing one family detached dwelling under sections 3.01, 3.3211, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 77 North Whitney Street, map 14B, parcel 98, general residence uh, RG zoning district. Uh, for this, uh, application, we've received the following submissions, the comments from our town engineer, GIS maps, uh, the project application report, and a special permit application packet. Are there any other submissions? Okay. Is that it, Maureen? Uh, I believe so. That, that's, that's all. Fantastic. Um, so on Tuesday, we had done a site visit of the property. Um, while we were there, some of the questions asked were um, about the vegetation of what was uh, going to stay and what was going to be removed. Um, the question was asked of whether or not the house would be larger than the other house that is currently there. Um, and would the uh, footprint of the new building match the footprint of the current building? Um, Question was asked about the rental property that is currently there. How many tenants are there? The answer to that was four. Um, asked about the garage use. Uh, I was told that was going to be for, or that was being used for landscaping equipment for the property. And then uh, we told lighting uh, where that would be and where that would extend out to, um, and that it would not trespass into the neighboring property. Was there anything else that we talked about on that site visit? All right. Um, who's going to be presenting for the applicant? Who would like to start? Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to, to do that. Um, my name is Chris Farley. I'm an architect with Kuhn Riddle Architects at 28 Amity Street in Amherst. Um, Joel Greenbaum, uh, the, the, the owner and applicant, is, uh, is on this uh, uh, hearing tonight as well, as is Bucky Sparkle, <laughs> civil engineer. Um, I think what I'd like to suggest is for Bucky to give a, a brief uh, overview of the site and site design, and then I will follow with a brief overview of the architectural building design. All right, go ahead. 
All right. Thank you, Chris. Well, for the record, I am Bucky Sparkle. I'm the site designer for this particular project. And I'm going to do a little bit of screen sharing as I, I walk us through uh, what's going on here. I think I'm going to start um, taking a page from Tom Reedy's book here with the Amherst Property Viewer, just to give a sense of you know, where we are in the world. Um, North Whitney runs here, Clifton Avenue is here, the railroad track runs on the east southeast side of the property, Knickerbocker Apartments abut to the north. Mr. Greenbaum also owns the property, the two properties to the south, but the highlighted one is the property in question. If we just take a quick aerial imagery map and zoom in a little, whoop, maybe a little too much, um, you'll see that the, the entire front lawn is open and is quite flat, and that was evident at the site visit. There are a couple of street trees which are going to remain in place, but the new construction is going to end up in this big open area. And the front of the new building is roughly parallel with the front of the adjacent building down here. So that, that gives you a sense of where we're, we're coming from over here. Um, and then to go over to the plans that were submitted, we'll start with the existing conditions plan. Same thing, north is now basically to the left with the railroad back here and North Whitney Street down here. Um, and the, the green shaded area is the, the tree line, you know, big open front yard, a couple of bushes around, a uh, hedgerow. Uh, we have uh, the main building on the site now is a one, uh, one unit, four bedroom. Uh, it has five parking spaces through here and sort of some extra space back here for parking. There's currently a five car garage on site as well. And, <clears throat> excuse me. That is not for tenant use, that is just for the property owner, Mr. Greenbaum's use. Uh, there used to be a swimming pool back here that was recently removed, uh, partly in preparation for this project. And there's a little shed in the back. This is the property that's also owned by Mr. Greenbaum and here's Knickerbocker Apartments. Uh, there's one long driveway, it's not all that long, but one driveway that runs along the Southern lot line uh, accessing the parking area. Looking at the proposed conditions. Um, so I'm, this is a slightly different scale. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can, you know, make better use of the, the content that's here. Uh, and see it hopefully a little bit better. Um, you can see just the edge of the, the house next door. The front of that house comes all the way out down here. It's, it's cut off just so we can focus on the main lot. But we are proposing uh, a new building, which is the overall structure, everything that's shaded the main building and the porch area, uh, that's just over 2,100 square feet. The main part of the building is almost 1,700 square feet. And to compare that to the existing structure, one of those questions that came up, the existing structure is about 1,800 square feet. So the main part of this house is actually a little smaller than the other, the existing structure. When you add on the porch, it adds on another 400 square feet and change. So overall, it's about 2,100 square feet. So it'll it will seem you know footprint wise, it's a little bit bigger, but the mass of the building is going to feel a little smaller because it's not all a two story structure. Uh, there is parking six parking spaces that are going to come off of the existing driveway, and uh, uh, egress walk to the rear as well as a walk to the front porch entrance. Uh, we have landscaping along the side of the building and landscaping doubling as shielding for the parking area, screening for the parking area that runs along the uh, roadside edge there. We do have uh, the content of that, um, the landscape plan you know, detailed here if you wanna look at individual plants. Um, we also do point out that the, the two maple trees are remaining in place. We're gonna bring utilities to the road uh, right between the two trees. Um, this plan was reviewed by Jason Skeels, as I understand, he didn't have any comments. The electric and communication utilities are planned to be buried if they let us do that, which is probably gonna be the case. And um, there's also a bioretention area or rain garden in the back. Um, this also is an area for trash and recycling. It has a five foot screen fence around it so that the neighbors can't see it. Um, and it has some landscaping in front of it. So it's gonna be very difficult uh, to, to get a good line of sight on, 
on that you know modern necessity um let's see uh oh lighting so we do have uh the, this l-shaped light area is the porch and we have four lights that are in the soffit so these are downcast built-in overhead lights at the rear egress there is um, a, what, a farm style barn style light and we have uh, photometric information and cut sheets for this we can look at if you like so that's over the door and then this light that's mounted at the corner of the building is going to be 20 feet up it's a dark sky compliant wall pack and its job is to illuminate the parking area and the walkways and if we looked at, at the photometrics what you would see is that it does a nice job illuminating this area but the foot candles fall to zero before you get to the lot line to the abutter here or over the lot line to the right of way. So we're not transmitting any meaningful light from the building uh, beyond just the area that needs to be illuminated. Um, I'm going to jump to the next page, which will have the contours and grading plan, as well as some other information. Um, what I want to point out here is uh, the Everything drains very gradually to the top of the page. It's, it's sort of east northeast. And that's also where we're going to be putting the snow storage area. So that's an easy place to drop that material. It also eventually lets it melt out and be filtered through a grass area before getting to the rain garden itself. This yellow orange line that goes around the building, that is to collect roof water. So the gutters are all going to be piped. Uh, this is the only storm drain on the property or on the project is to take 100% of the roof water, and bring it into the rain garden. Uh, almost 100% of all the new impervious area goes into the rain garden. Um, and uh, it's, it's a highly functional system. Uh, I, I will also, oh, we also have a, a temporary sediment area, sediment basin. So these are construction controls. That area there is designed to capture runoff uh, and any sediment gets stuck there before moving downstream um, and then we have a silt fence that's going to go around the entire construction facility or a, uh, um, a straw waddle depend it's it's a very flat site so you may not need more than that waddle um, if i jump quickly just because we've got it to the photometric plan well you know, let me go back to the whole page, excuse my misclicking. So we have uh, the light fixtures shown here, I'll get a little closer. So this is the barn type light, you know, this classic style that's going to be downcast, dark sky compliant. This is the light pack, the wall pack that will be mounted 20 feet on the wall of the building that has a confined beam downward. And what I was eventually trying to get to is the, the photometric plan itself, where um, you know, the numbers are a little hard to read. So what I hopefully, yep, it's there. So that sort of shaded area, that is everything of 0 0.1 foot candles or higher. Anything outside of that shaded area, that highlighted area, registers as 0, 0.0 foot candles of light on the ground. So as you can see at the lot line, there's no light. At the lot line, there's no light. Um, but, and it does a really nice job covering uh, the walkways. Um, then of course, uh, the building lamps will, will handle the staircases themselves. Um, to briefly uh, summarize, we did submit a stormwater management report. Um, of course, you know, being just a, a two unit building, uh, there aren't any state standards that apply. So what I've done is, you know, look, looked at, well, I don't have to go through the whole methodology, but um, when you we're adding 3,836 square feet of impervious area with the, the parking and the walks and the building. We also removed a pool. So the balance is only 1,316 square feet of impervious area. However, I will say that when I did my hydrocad modeling, the, the fancy number output stuff, I ignored that, the pool situation. I, so this is a very conservative design. It accounts for all of the 3,836 square feet and pretends that the pool is still there effectively. So even with the numbers that come out pretty good, they're re really gonna be better than that. Um, we have, for most storms, a decrease in the flow rate. 
for all star storms, we have a decrease in the volume of water leaving the site because there are no current stormwater controls. The addition of the rain garden uh, captures and infiltrates a fairly large volume of water and um, it's less, less than existing, for example, 900 cubic feet uh, come off at the uh, current condition, it'll be 216 cubic feet will come off in the proposed condition. Uh, we're capturing 90% of the total su suspended solids, 80% of requirement there, so we're exceeding that requirement. Uh, if, if those requirements were required from the state standards. Um, I did go out there and perform uh, soil testing to get a sense of what's out there where the groundwater was that provided some basis for designing recharge. And we only require 38 cubic feet of groundwater recharge. We are providing for any storm of modest size over 400 cubic feet. So this is more than 10 times what the state would normally require in terms of groundwater recharge. And the main reason why the volume of water being discharged is actually less after this project is, is installed. We're also providing a construction period pollution prevention plan, as well as an operation maintenance plan. They're all part of the stormwater management report. Um, and with that, it might be best to uh, see if the board has any questions or we can pass it back to Mr. Farley. Yeah, let's go ahead and just stop for one moment here. Does anybody have any questions about um, Mr. Sparkle has presented up to this moment or we like to just continue moving through the presentation? Ms. Parks? Um, do you have a picture that shows both houses, like the the uh, relationship between the two houses? Um, like a, a front view, elevation view? Just with both houses in one picture. On on the lot. You know, this, this is probably the best I have right now. And you can see the front porch of the existing house. And I know that's not not the whole thing. The, the proposed conditions I did provide you know, more detail and zoomed in on the front of the property. Um, but this, this front porch area, you know, if we were to go back to the overall, you, this is the same front porch right in this location. So if, I don't know if I can do an excellent job estimating this. Uh, working on a strange computer. Always a slight challenge. Let's see if I can uh, try and draw in. Where, um, this has a different setup. I'm so sorry. So I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do more than wave the cursor around, but the, the new structure, if you said the front of the new structure is very similar within two feet of the front of the abutting structure. So that structure, is going to line up through here and it comes up uh, through this area. It doesn't sit directly in front of this dwelling. You'll be able to see the original structure. This part of the site is entirely open. I guess I'm just wondering about the impact of the of the people who are living in in dwelling unit one. Is there going to be any kind of vegetation between the two houses or not really? Uh, beyond the, well, there'll be the rain garden, but that's not going to be direct line of sight between the two buildings. Obviously, there's some amount of plantings and landscaping at this building, uh, but presently there aren't any plans uh, between the line of sight in this building and the proposed one. Of course, they're both owned by Mr. Greenbaum. Okay. Uh, if, if, if I could um, uh just say a couple of things about the, the, the site design. So you can see in this plan, the Knickerbocker Apartments, to, uh, uh, which is to the north or to the left on these drawings. What we did was we tried to keep the, the, the new building um, uh, not too close to the Knickerbocker Apartments because they have decks uh, on the south side that look out onto this the, 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 uh, the, the front lawn of this existing dwelling number 77. Um, and, and we also tried to, to, to place the new building uh, as close as practical to the existing driveway so that the, uh, the front of that number 77, the existing dwelling, can look out toward uh, uh, North Whitney Street, kind of between the Knickerbocker Apartments and the proposed uh, duplex. So even though the proposed duplex, depending on where you are, is 
uh, could be said to be in front of that existing dwelling. There's a fair amount of open space between the existing dwelling and the Knickerbocker apartments, uh, which the, the um, uh, existing building looks out upon uh, toward, toward uh, North Whitney. That, that's so uh, uh, Bucky's just you know done an approximation here. So you can see that uh, that it is technically in front of that building, but there's a lot of open space um, uh, just to the north or the left in this drawing of the proposed building. Thank you. Does that uh, answer your question, Ms. Parks? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, any other questions at this time? If not, well, yeah, let's I go ahead. Question. I had one question. Uh, so I noticed that um, perhaps the site plan has been updated to uh, show a snow uh, storage area. Is that correct? Yeah, that's on the grading and drainage plan. Oh, it was on that plan. OK, was it's, that there? Yeah, the it, it wasn't on the, yeah. The proposed conditions are over two different two different plans, depending on content. So that snow storage area is, is right here. Okay, sorry, thank you. Yep, that's good. Um, any other questions? Uh, if not, we'll go ahead. Uh, let's move on to uh, Mr. Farley. If you'd like to uh, go ahead and get started. Oh, uh, you're, you're muted. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay, so uh, this is the uh, uh, the drawing sheet that was part of the special permit submittal. Uh, can, can everyone see this? Yep, looks good. Excellent. Okay, um, so uh, this is the the floor plan of the proposed duplex. Uh, this is that wraparound porch uh, that goes on uh, that, that is located on the uh, the west and the south side of the building. The parking is is here to the south of the proposed building. Um, uh, the walkway comes up to the front porch. Uh, there's a door on the front of the house, which is the door to the second floor apartment. Uh, when you go through that door, you go up a set of stairs. Uh, and uh, uh, come out here on the second floor uh, apartment. And the first floor apartment uh, has a, a door off of the side porch that goes into a small vestibule with a closet and then into the living space. Uh, both apartments are, are virtually identical in terms of their layout. They're, they're both three bedroom apartments. There's living space, uh, living dining kitchen in the front. Uh, there are two bathrooms uh, in, in, in the middle part of the building. Uh, and then in the back, there's the second means of egress uh, stairway that then goes out a, a, a back door uh, to the walkway that, that, that Bucky showed on the plan. Um, the, uh, the exterior of the building, uh, the style of the building is what I would call Greek revival. Um, it's a, a, a fairly uh, simple, uh, typical uh, of many structures in Amherst. Uh, it's a gable roof, uh, a main gable roof with a cross gable uh, on the side. Um, it is, it is a, a wood framed building with painted wood clapboards. Uh, the proposed color is, is represented uh, here in this drawing. It's kind of a, a, a warm neutral or a, a uh, kind of a yellowy beige. Uh, the porch will have uh, uh, freestanding columns. Um, there'll be a fairly substantial corner boards on the building uh, painted. Uh, the windows will be double hung windows with um, their aluminum clad wood uh, that they will be black. Uh, all the trim will be painted white. There'll be a, a, a gray asphalt shingle roof and then uh, the, the, uh, the gable uh, the, uh, inside the, the closed pediment uh, of the gable will be a uh, 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 tongue and groove uh, 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 flat uh, board siding painted white. Um, this is the side of the building that is facing the parking, the south side. This is the cross gable uh, where there are 
two bedrooms. Uh, this is the side porch. This is the front door to the, the ground floor apartment. This is the back door, uh, egress door. This is the, uh, um, uh, the enameled uh, uh, light that Bucky showed us. And this is the wall pack light that lights the parking area on this side of the building. Um, this is the, the north side of the building. Uh, it's essentially all in one plane. Um, you can see the front porch here uh, and the, the, uh, the side of the gable. And then this is the back um, of the building. Again, the, the, the white painted uh, closed pediment, um, the off-white uh, off uh, beige yellow uh, paint color. This is that um, 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 enameled fixture for the, for the rear, uh, rear door. Um, let's see, I, I, I think that's a, that's a pretty good overview of, of the building design. Uh, I'd be happy to go into more detail if anyone has any questions. Uh, I actually have one question about that. That, that rear door, um, if you actually zoom in on the uh, interior of that, actually. Ah. In the top right. So that's that's a shared area and there's a door in the hall that uh, prevents access from the top to the bottom, correct? That's exactly right. Uh, this is a common stairway. Uh, it's a second means of egress, but this, this door here at the back of the hall is the security door uh, for the first floor apartment. Uh, and then the, uh, the second floor apartment has that same door um, uh, to provide that security. And is the intention of that um, that back door is is it just supposed to be used in an emergency only, or that's just a, a another means of, of egress for uh, the tenants? I, I think it's it's it, it's a code requirement. Uh, we need to have two means of egress as as remote from each other as possible. Uh, so we have this one in back, and then the two in in, uh, uh, in front. Um, so the intention is that it is it's a it's a code remire, a code required egress. Uh, I'm guessing that um, depending on, on where a tenant may park, uh, the tenant could possibly use this uh, to get in and out of the building. Uh, uh, you know, if they, for instance, if they live in, in bedroom three or on the second floor. Um, but I think the intention is that the two uh, front doors off of that front porch, that's, that's, that it, those are the, uh, the main uh, entries to both these apartments. Thank you. Any um, any other questions about the uh, architecture plans at this point, uh, Ms. Parks? I don't know if this is an important question or not, but is the the house the existing house is blue? Is that correct? Um, you know, that's a great question, uh, Joel. I, I I'm afraid I don't know that answer off the top of my head. Joel, do you do you possibly know? It is blue. I'm, I'm just wondering if there's going to be any attempt to match these properties. You've got, I'm, I'm just, I. Each one of these properties has its own distinctive architectural style. The blue one's federal, this one's Greek revival. The one at 67 is Victorian. They're all unique and personal in their own way. There's gonna be no I'm not looking to match them all like an apartment complex now. Okay. The uh, the property right next door, that one's green. Am I correct about that one? You are correct. Okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, Mr. Meadows? Um, I have a few problems here with this. One is that wall pack that you've got to light up the parking lot is going to cast an awful lot of light into the neighborhood. Uh, I don't think that's an appropriate place for it. Um, I, 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 I think I understand your concern, but I will say that the, the photometric plan that, that Bucky reviewed shows that uh, the lighting cutoff for this uh, LED fixture is inside the property line. I, I, 
on. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it's inside the property line, but somebody uh, driving down the street, somebody farther down to the south on North Whitney is going to see quite a lot of light there. I don't, I don't see that as an appropriate place to put uh, essentially a parking lot light that is going to cast a lot of light into the neighborhood. Um, Bucky, could you could you maybe address yeah, yes. that concern? I'm just double checking some of the notes here. Let me make sure I'm I'm not muted. Am I? No, I'm not. Okay. Um, uh, just double checking some of my notes on the lighting because we do have it as a house side side shield as an external glare shield specifically to you know help reduce the the very thing that that Mr. Meadows is speaking about of the light you know from the from the street uh, entering into the street um, the the lens shape um, is is very very focused uh, so that we are. You know, it is dark sky compliant, so we are we are definitely facing straight down, and we're keeping the foot candles you know, on the ground to you know zero at the property line. You know, out in the street is considerably farther than this um, light mechanism is designed to throw light. Um, so, I, I'm not saying it's going to throw light out into the street. I'm saying that it's it's going to be observed from quite a distance away, particularly since it's uh, higher up than uh, and then as you go south on North Whitney Street, uh, how many foot candles is it at the, uh, how many foot candles is it at the parking lot? At the parking lot? Let mm -hmm. me pull up that, those numbers so that I can read them. Um, we are, the maximum in the parking lot reads as one and a half foot candles. Okay, can you get that down? to what number location well i i know that you don't you don't have to put any more than one foot candle in a parking lot sure and we're also down to to 0 0.4 foot candles at the edge and 0.2 foot candles at another edge so we're, we're trying to you know obviously illuminate all the necessary area without having a, a giant difference between the the bright spots and the dark spots who's one is going to glare out the other. You we'll may, be able to may need to look at relocating, relocating or, or putting them out in a different location. I'm going to let uh, Mr. Greenbaum, looks like he has a response. Go ahead, Mr. Greenbaum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I might uh, suggest maybe we could lower the light on the house it down a little bit so that it just illuminates the parking spaces and not much further. That might help. I think that's a good idea. The other thing that I, 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 ever since I read through the material is I don't understand the word complementary in this. Um, yeah, would you like to respond? What, what do you mean by complement? I think I understand it, but I'll, I'll let you go ahead and answer that you one. You said that this is a complementary, the building is complementary to the location. I mean, if it's if it's my understanding is complementary, it's a complementary use as to what's already being used in that location. Am I correct about that understanding? I'm, of complementary? I'm asking the question. I don't know that that's that that's a possible answer. I don't know if it's the correct one. Uh, maybe okay. Maureen can explain how that could be in this location. Yes. So the applicant part of the applicant's um, proposal or uh, requested um, special permit. Um, and, and applicable sections includes uh, section 3.01 under the zoning bylaw, which states the development or operation on a single lot more than one dwelling or more than one of the principal uses described in section 3.3, that's the use classification uh, chart, is expressly prohibited except where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other or where otherwise provided by this bylaw. So the board needs to make a finding um, to determine whether these two proposed, these two uses are complementary to one another. So there's an existing single family home and the applicant is proposing uh, a, 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 uh, a duplex on the property. So there'd be a total of three dwelling units on the property. Um, 
So, you know, I often, when I meet with prospective applicants, uh, one example of something that would um, would be not very obviously not complementary to one another would be if you had a single family home and now you want to propose like a gas station on the property. Those seemingly are not compatible. Um, having two, uh, you know, low density sing, uh, residential uses on a single property on a a, a very large property um, lot um, seem, you know, seems like it is complementary, but I'll let the applicant make their case. Um, I believe that this property could provide um, several other dwelling units on this property um, and uh, the applicant is um, is um, keeping this at a low density uh, amount of units on the property. I, I know what low density means here. You know, I'm in Wellfleet at the moment, but what, what does low density mean in Amherst as far as the density of the number of units on a particular size of property? Um, well, uh, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, low density, it's not defined in the zoning bylaw, so it'd be up to, you know, our interpretation, but, um, you know, um, multifamily or, or like apartment buildings in Amherst starts off at, you know, three units or more. Um, you know, you would, you know, you one could say that, you know, less than five units, for instance, is, is low density. Um, and, you know, if you go, you know, five to 10, maybe that would, five to 10 or five to 15 units, maybe that's medium de density and something beyond that would be high density. I mean, I think that is up to sort of interpretation of, of what um, density means to folks, but I, I can let the applicants speak to that if they wish. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Greenbaum. Thank you very much. Um, I certainly don't know the definition between high and low density, but the size of this lot allows me up to 14 units. So if you want to put 14 units on that lot, that might be considered high density. I'm, I'm trying to do something smaller and a little more tasteful and a little more befitting the neighborhood. And I think that this proposal accomplishes that. So that's my definition of density. Uh, Mr. Meadows, you had a, a follow-up response or any other questions about the architecture? No, I like the architecture. I that's that was not the question. The question was, I don't I don't know what the definition of low and high density is, and so I was asking. And also, come you know the definition of complementary use. Uh, does anybody else have any questions about the uh, architectural plans? Um, if not, is there anything else left in the presentation or does the architecture uh, presentation kind of conclude that? Uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, I, I would say that that concludes my presentation, but I'm, I think Bucky and I and, and, and Mr. Greenbaum are all available to, uh, to answer any questions that may come up. Um, any other questions just in general about the, the application before I go to public comment from board members? If not, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open up the public comment. If you have any others, you'll have a chance to uh, ask them afterwards. Uh, so yeah, right now uh, for public comment, if you'd like to make a uh, public comment, go ahead and use the raise hand function and we will get you in. Looks like we have uh, Bob Newcomb. Go ahead and uh, let him speak. And Bob, once you get on, if you could just state your name and your uh, address for the record. I can't hear you, Maureen. Uh, hi, Bob. I tried to unmute you. you. You may need to press a button. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Thank you. My name is Bob Newcomb. I'm at 87 North Whitney Street. Um, my question is not so much the um, very nice new addition to the neighborhood. It's street parking, adding in two more units in this particular area. And after this particular year with a couple more residents living at 67 
um, North Whitney, people parking on the street, that's at the top of a hill. Coming up the street and going down the street, if there are cars parked right in front of those units, you cannot see anything around them until you are in the other lane and cars are right on top of you. Um, the speed that some people tend to come up here going to the schools and the university, it's a cut through, especially in the commuter times. Um, it can be rather um, dicey at times if there are cars parked on the street. So just thinking about that particular um, addition to the neighborhood and, and if that can be addressed in some way. Thank you, Mr. Newcomb. Uh, any other public comment? I've got one from Ellie. We want to go ahead and Ellie in. All right, and then um, I'll oh, go ahead okay. and address for the record. You can hear me? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Elena Davis. I live at 20 Clifton Ave. And um, I, sorry, I'm, I'm driving in a car, so I'm just going to try to find a spot where I can pull over safely. Um, I just wanted to express concerns about this. You know, this is a lovely neighborhood. I just moved back to Amherst. I was there as a graduate student, I mean, as an undergraduate student, and came back and bought a house in a place where my kids could walk to school and, you know, enjoy town um, and have a sense of community. Um, and I feel like the neighborhood has changed a lot just in the last two years as far as composition. Um, so I have nothing against college students. I was one myself once, um, but college students don't always make the best neighbors. So, um, you know, in a, in a short period of time, I've had things go missing from my porch and people walking on my lawn, waking me up at night and my kids. Um, and, you know, that's, I think, I, I appreciate a sense of balance in our neighborhood, but I'm concerned that we're going to get close to a tipping point by adding more non-owner occupied homes. Um, you know, South Whitney Street is not that far away from us, but I would say for anyone who's traveled on it recently, it has gone past the tipping point where it's now almost exclusively a student street. Um, and I'm just concerned about preserving, you know, the kind of neighborhood that I moved back to Amherst to live in um, and, and having neighbors who uh, I can trust. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like Amherst is, has lost its way a little bit as far as the planning and building. and I'm, I'm a little discouraged because my sense is that this project is probably going to go through regardless of, of what I say to you, but I'm just imploring you to, you know, remember that us townsfolk also like to live close to the town center and access all the wonderful things about Amherst. Um, and if this neighborhood um, becomes too saturated, I'm not going to stay in my house. And I don't know, maybe it will be turned into student housing as well. I think that would be very sad but I just really want um, you as the board to keep sight of that idea of balance and really thinking about, you know, having everyone being able to share the, the street. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other public comment at this time? We'll give the applicant a chance to respond. Um, maybe I'll step in here. Uh, just sorry, one more moment. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, hearing none, uh, I'm going to go ahead, uh, pass the review. Folks, let you respond to uh, the questions raised by the uh, previous two speakers. Okay. Um, and, and of course, we're all kind of a team here. We all have our degree of expertise. Um, well, there was, there was a question about uh, you know, parking here and street parking. Um, there are f two units, there are four required parking spaces, there are six provided parking spaces. There are also strict controls in the lease that limit how many uh, guests can be there. The guests can only stay two nights. 
So the propensity for all of these parking spaces to be filled and overfilled is, is really low. This is not a, a party house. And um, both to both Bob and to Ellie, I will say that I've, I've known Joel and, and he and his family have been managing properties very well and have an excellent track record in Amherst. Uh, they're uh, a large percentage of students as their clients. They do a great job screening. They do a great job managing uh, their properties. There are virtually no complaints uh, for any of the properties. So they, they do an excellent job of handling the, the social side, the impact on the community that uh, a student population tends to, to bring along. So I, I have confidence that, that the Greenbaum family will continue uh, with this property as well, in terms of making sure that you know you, there's not a lot of loud noises, that the you know the tenants are uh, respectful, and um, he's he's like I said, got a lot of years under his belt of doing this, and he's he's done a great job. One of my favorite clients, uh, and that's one of the reasons. So I think we'll have the parking covered, and I don't believe this is going to be a nuisance property because none of Joel's properties are nuisance properties. Mr. Sparkle. Um, yeah, I guess I'll even uh, come in here. Uh, I forgot to do a disclosure at the start of this one. I have uh, no uh, financial uh, disclosures to make anything with uh, Mr. Greenbaum, but I can say that I live in, uh, I've lived in downtown Amherst uh, for about seven years and I've been adjacent to one of Mr. Greenbaum's property, which is rented to undergraduate students. And I believe in say the six years that I've been here, I haven't had any issues um, with any noise or anything from those properties. So I think a concern, very valid concern is that we're having family neighbors turn into um, college, uh, you know, less family neighborhoods and more essentially college dormitories off campus. That's, that's a concern that I share as well. Um, and I feel at least confident uh, with Mr. Greenbaum as an applicant, uh, as somebody who has a good track record of of managing properties in Amherst. So with that in mind, as an applicant, I feel confident. And for me, this is really more the issue of the uh, application itself and whether or not that seems to fit within the uh, within the downtown that at this time right now, or where it's located. At this time, I feel relatively confident about it. Uh, and I'd like to hear from other board members what they're thinking with their concerns. I know we have concerns with lighting. I think that's something that we should definitely uh, address for approval or approving something like that with conditions. I'd like to hear from everybody else kind of where they're feeling right now on the board. Um, would like to start. Got a quick question. Um, take a look over at these plans. It appears as though that rear stairwell uh, also carries down below the first floor. Are you guys uh, gonna be providing a basement there? And if so, is that, what's the utility down there? Is that just, uh, you know, uh, mechanical equipment and storage space or? What's that look like? Um, uh, Joel, do you want to address that? So yes, that that stairwell does go to the basement. And once you get in the basement, there's a long hallway. And to the right, you have two locked storage areas, one for apartment one, one for apartment two, keyed to yep. their apartment. And on the left, is another locked space, which is all the mechanicals. That's our space. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, actually, actually uh, reminded me of a question as well. The uh, that window in the attic, I take it that's, uh, is the attic going to be finished in any way or be accessible? Or that's just a, a decorative window there. That's a decorative window. The attic is, is made out of trusses. You can't get up there. Thank but you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from uh, board members at this time? All right, uh, hearing none, um, want to move into uh, findings and conditions. Uh, one of the things before we jump into that uh, is 
do we think that we have enough information to make a decision on this today? Uh, I know with lighting, if we're going to be making changes to lighting, you may want to put a condition in that the applicant would come back to the board that we would approve uh, the lighting plan specifically, um, but could approve everything else if we wanted to. Uh, is that something that we would want to do? Um, I'm going to ask you, Mr. Meadows, because I know lighting was uh, the concern that you had brought up. Would that be something you might be amenable to? Uh, I would like to see a lighting plan, yes. Got it. Um, all right, then. Uh, if we're all okay with that, I'm going to go ahead and say that we move into uh, making specific findings. Pull up the applicant board here. Sorry, just one moment here while I pull this up to load it. And Maureen, again, procedurally, I can start um, for this one. I want to start with section seven. Am I correct about that? Yeah. Or start with section uh, three? You can start with, um, you know, yeah, uh, let's see here. Yeah, you could start at seven and um, then proceed with 10.38. And um, hold on a second. Let me, I'm just sorry, I'm scrolling up. Um, Yeah, you could start. Uh, um, well, you could. You could. Uh, it, it all depends where you want to start. Uh, you could start with seven and then go to ten point three eight, and you could start finish or start with three point oh one. I'll go ahead and start with three point oh one. It's at the top of the list here. Um, so, section uh, three point oh one: the development or operation of a single lot. More than one dwelling unit, uh, prohibited use, section 0.3.3 .3 expressly prohibited, except where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other or where otherwise provided in this bylaw. Um, yeah, as we went over that, the applicant is proposing two principal uses, one non-owner occupied duplex, maintaining the existing one family detached dwelling on the premises. Um, yeah, we need to make the finding on whether or not the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other. Uh, I believe that we do make this finding. Um, and then for uh, section seven for dwellings, including apartments, um, for parking uh, access and regulations, two parking spaces for each dwelling unit shall be provided, um, so on and so forth for parking regulations here. Um, the proposal meets the uh, section seven, uh, the breakdown existing parking uh, for existing family homes, the existing five parking spaces the tenants, um, the existing building plus one visitor space and the driveway access will remain. Proposed parking for the proposed duplex, the applicant wishes to utilize the existing driveway on the premise, uh, construct six, uh, nine by 18 parking spaces for the use of the tenants residing in the proposed duplex. The proposed parking ratio is one parking space for each bedroom presided. Um, 7.10, design standards, parking plan requirements. The applicant provides a proposed parking plan, which shows the proposed driveways, grading, slope, drainage, design, setback, layout, location on the site, circulation, lighting, landscaping, and other pertinent features. Uh, 7.101 for paving. The applicant proposes to prepare the subgrade and compacted gravel base uh, with 12 inch deep appropriate grading and drainage with two inch bitumous concrete binder and surfaced with one inch top coat of bitumous concrete. Uh, 7.102 slope, uh, the proposal meets this requirement. 7.013 setback from the building, the proposal meets this requirement. Uh, 7.104 dimensions, marketing and delineation. Um, all proposed spaces are 9.10 feet in size. All individual parking spaces will be painted marked or otherwise delineated uh, as a standard condition of this permit. 7.106 entrance and exit driveways. Uh, the exit driveways along North Whitney Street is 17.7 feet wide at the property line. The existing driveway is located, give or take 125 feet from North Whitney uh, Street, Clifton Ave at an intersection of 895 feet plus feet from North Whitney Street, Main Street intersection. 
The applicant provides 17.7 feet wide in order to accommodate a two-way entrance driveway for section 7.106. Minimum width of the entrance and exits shall be 18 feet wide uh, for two-way use. And we have um, the 7.11 landscape standards. Uh, the section is not applicable to the proposal. However, the applicant does provide- uh, I'm sorry, may I interrupt you? Um, so, um, the so the what is it the existing draw enter uh, entrance and exit yep. um, is, um, doesn't quite meet the re the requirement for a two way drive mm -hmm. of the minimum standard is eighteen feet and they're off by 0.3 feet so it's seventeen point seven feet wide so the board technically should um, no, make a finding under section 7.9 for uh, waiving that that minimal distance, uh, uh, minimal width uh, difference, rather. And procedurally, we do that at the time of um, approval of conditions? Correct, yeah. Yep, when you make your final motion to decide on the permit and uh, with conditions, yep. Thank you. Um, so 7.11 landscape standards, uh, this section is not applicable to the proposal. Uh, yeah, again, they did provide us um, with landscaping along the south building, which equals to uh, 522 square feet of dedicated landscaping along the parking area, uh, 7.111 parking areas of 25 more spaces, not applicable uh, to this proposal. Uh, 7.112 screening, uh, the applicant provides vegetative screening to block views of the proposed parking places from the front property line to North Whitney Street and adjacent properties. Um, now we'll move into uh, 10.38 specific findings required. So 10.380 and 10.381. Uh, the applicant is proposing construction of a non-owner occupied duplex as a complementary principal use for the existing one family detached dwelling. There's a mix of housing density in the surrounding neighborhood with single family homes, duplexes, three unit buildings, among other density sizes. Uh, 10.382, 10.383, and 10.385 and 10.387. Uh, the proposal provides planting to visually shield uh, proposed parking to the front property line along North Whitney Street and abutting properties to the west. Existing vegetative along uh, existing vegetation along the north property line provides screening to the abutting property to the north. Train tracks and existing vegetation run along the east property line. The applicant proposes dark sky compliant lighting, which will not spill out over into any abutting properties. Um, 10.384, utility services are found to be adequate for the operation of the existing proposed use. 10.386, the proposal meets the parking requirement. Signage is not proposed. 10.387, safe vehicular and pedestrian movement is found on the site. 10.388, finding is not applicable to the project. 10.389, uh, before the issuance of any building permit, the applicant shall obtain sewer, water, driveway, and trench permits for the, from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Two gallon poly garbage carts and two 96 gallon recycling carts are proposed to located at the southwest rear corner of the building. Trash to be picked up every week and recycling to be picked up every two weeks by USA. Trash and recycling will be screened with a five foot high stockade fence on three sides. 10.390, uh, all new uh, produce area will be directed to a bioretention area, a rain garden, where over 400 cubic feet of runoff will be recharged to the groundwater. There will be no outdoor HVAC equipment provided. New water and sewer connections will be made to the municipal services on North Whitney and power communication will be brought in from nearby utility poles. All utilities are scheduled to be underground. A bicycle rack and trash recycle facilities will be at the rear of the new building. 10.391, the architectural style of the proposed duplex keeps with the architectural style of the existing family home on the premises known as Greek Revival. 10.392. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I made a slight mistake. So as uh, the applicant said earlier, the proposed architectural style for the duplexes Greek Revival 
and the existing single family home is, I forget what it is. Um, uh, it's not Victorian, that's the abutting house. I forget what you had said. Uh, but I, I, uh, federal style. Federal style, no. Oh, federal, there you go, sorry about that. Um, 10.392, uh, the proposal includes an array of landscaping provided on the premises in order to screen from the adjacent residential use, well as for visual interest to be enjoyed by the tenants and neighbors, uh, see above for the uh, plan submitted. 10.393, the applicant proposes dark sky compliant lighting, which will not spill over into any abutting properties. 10.394, uh, there are no wetland resources or associated buffers found within 200 feet of the premises. 10.395, the proposed duplex is located in the RG zoning uh, district and is not within the boundaries of a national historic district or local historic districts. The board will need to make a finding on whether the proposal is in harmony with respect uh, to the terrain and to the use, scale, and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity which have functional or visual relationship there too. 10.396, the proposed location for trash and recycling will be screened from the adjacent properties. 10.397, sufficient open space is located on the site. 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the master plan, section four, objective H.3, which encourages opportunities for proper infill development the board needs to determine whether the proposal meets the applicable uh, zoning bylaw sections, including 3.01, 7.9, 9.22, and 10.38, which I believe we have done. And also, sorry, I had forgot to type in uh, section 3.3211, which is the non-owner occupied duplex. And have we read that one uh, earlier in this proposal into the record? I believe so. Fantastic. Now with that in mind, I want to move on to uh, some proposed conditions here, and then we can go ahead and add on any others that we might like to. Um, so for possible conditions of approval, the project shall be built and maintained according to the approved uh, plans and application package. Any changing shall be reviewed by the building commissioner to determine if the submission of the zoning order of appeals is necessary. Um, just moving on to what we have here. We have um, all the applications that we have uh, submitted, everything that was approved, the, uh, the application, the management plan, um, parking sticker, lease agreement, uh, all the submissions here that we have uh, received. That will be in accordance with that. Uh, number two, all rooms to be used uh, as labeled on the following approved four plans, A1 uh, special permit for and Special permit plan and elevations prepared by J.R.R. of Kuhn Riddle Architects, dated March 19, 2022. Uh, B, a floor plan, 77 North Whitney Street for existing one family detached dwelling, prepared by Joel Greenbaum. Number three, uh, this special permit shall expire upon the change of ownership. Number four, the maximum number of overnight visitors uh, per unit shall be two people with a maximum stay of two consecutive nights. Number five, the maximum number of people on the premises at any time shall be eight people. Uh, number six, the approved management plan and complaints response plan shall be followed by the property owner. Uh, number seven, any changes to the management plan and the complaint response plan shall return to the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting. Number eight, all exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties, lighting fixtures shall be selected according to the dark sky compliance recommendations of the ZBA rules and regulations. Number nine, any dwelling unit on the property be rented, uh, being rented shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the residential rental property bylaw. Number 10, the street numbers for both dwelling units shall be clearly marked with reflective signage and be visible from the public right of way from both directions. Number 11, parking shall occur on improved surfaces only. The parking area shall be maintained as needed. Uh, the parking and drive area shall be constructed in accordance with the requirements of Article 7.1. 12, the property shall be free of litter and debris. 
and number 13, um, before the issuance of any building permits, the applicant shall obtain sewer, water, driveway, and trench permits from the Amherst Department of Public Works. Uh, with those conditions, um, does anyone have any objections to any of those conditions we have listed? Uh, Mr. Meadows, uh, go ahead. Well, or, we've yeah. already expressed it, uh, that we need a new lighting plan. Uh, secondly, is, is there a technical reason why the driveway cannot be in compliance as far as this width is concerned? Oh, Joel, you're muted. I'm sorry about that. Uh, we can make it compliant. It's only four inches, right? I know. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, so whatever you wish me to do is fine. We can make it compliant. It's no problem. Why not? Um, okay. Please. Of course. Go ahead and uh, add a condition that the uh, driveway will be in compliance with the zoning bylaw. Dylan, I'd uh, also like to add that, um, you know, contingent on those plans, you know, as submitted, um, you know, being required to, to sort of be held, also showcasing the basement just to make sure that that's encapsulated within the whole package as described. Uh, and if we're going to be reviewing the lighting plan, do we want to hold off on reviewing the, uh, the basement plan as well uh, in a condition that we put on here? Yeah, I mean, I assume that the basement is as described, but since we have to come back to take a peek at, you know, an updated light fixture um, based on you know, Mr. Meadows' comments here, you know, the, uh, the basement can absolutely be included just so that way everything's batched in. Got it. Uh, all right, so we'll want to see, um, before final approval, we will want to uh, see a uh, resubmission of the lighting plan uh, for approval, as well as the um, floor plan layout to include a basement uh, for approval as well. Is that how we would want to word that? Does that make sense, Maureen? Um, it depends on um, how the board wants to proceed with this. You could continue the public hearing until uh, a date, date and time certain, um, and have the applicant update the, um, the lighting plan and, uh, to reflect the, the changes to the light there, um, and, and including um, including the updated site plan to show the uh, driveway to be a minimum of 18 feet wide, and to update the floor plan um, to show the basement uh, to scale and labeled. Um, or so you could do that at, at a continued public hearing, um, or if you feel comfortable with it. Um, with these, um, you know, seemingly minor updates, you could close the public hearing and decide tonight um, with conditions and have the applicant come back at a public meeting, um, not a public hearing, but either that was way. Review and approval of the lighting and the uh, floor plan, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm more inclined uh, for the latter. Uh, is there any objections from anyone on the board to do this different uh, procedurally? No, I'll second you on that. All right. Um, well, then in that case, uh, I would entertain a motion to uh, approve this project uh, with the conditions as stated, with the inclusion of um, Condition 14, that the driveway be uh, in compliance with the zoning bylaws, um, these 18 feet, and then uh, an additional condition that um, the applicant will need to return again for a public meeting with a new lighting plan and a uh, floor uh, building layout of, uh, to include the uh, basement as well uh, for approval of ZBA at a public meeting. That's that all sounds good. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second, Jim. All right. Uh, then it's going to be a roll. Or I'm sorry. Is there any discussion of the motion? Hearing none. It's going to be a roll call vote. Air uh, votes aye. Miss Parks. Aye. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Aye. Uh, Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Uh, Mr. Cochran? Aye. 
All right, the uh, motion is approved. Um, Maureen, you'll be able to schedule uh, that, that follow-up for the lighting plan and everything. Yeah, uh, we most likely, um, so unlike, so if this was a public, continued public hearing, we would have to specify the date and time before you can like made the motion to continue it. Um, but we can now have a little leisure and base it upon when um, the applicant, you know, can um, submit this. So you would, um, so, you know, the board meets on and, and upon their, you know, their availability. So the next time the ZBA is meeting is, is um, June, hold on one second, is June the 23rd. And uh, we do have a, a couple public hearings already scheduled for that evening, but if you um, can get that, get, get these updated in time for that meeting, we most likely could fit you in on that agenda. I'm Mr. Grima. I have one question. Uh, the basement plan is easy. The lighting plan should be no problem. How, what do I do for the, for, to make the driveway compliant? What do I need to show you? Do I just need to show you a drawing of the driveway at the proper width or what, what do you require? Civil drawings indicating the uh, 18 feet. With. Okay, so a, a drawing of the existing and then some dotted lines of it showing the 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 eighteen foot. Correct. Yeah, just that little four inch addition. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Maureen, I'm sorry. What, uh, what was the date in June uh, that you mentioned? Uh, Ju June twenty third, Thursday, June twenty third, and the meeting would start at six, and okay. we most likely could put you first because you'll hopefully be yeah relatively. Um, relatively uh, a quick review. So. Okay, and um, how, how uh, when do we need to get the plans in in order to, to be on that agenda for the 23rd? Um, we would need everything by the 16th, so next Thursday. Okay. And if the 23rd doesn't work, June 23rd doesn't work, we could fit you in for the following meeting, which would be July the 14th, Thursday, July 14th. So then he would have until July 7th, or I would say a little earlier, you, uh, by like, by the 4th of July, if possible. All right, uh, I think that does it. Uh, congratulations, we'll um, talk to you shortly, um, just about the lighting in the basement. Yeah, and so you could just uh, email me, or you know, next week when, or tomorrow, when you can sort of figure out uh, which meeting date would, would be, um, uh, doable on your end. Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, board members. Um, have a good evening. Do the same. Appreciate it. Good night. All right. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our final agenda item, which is uh, public comment. Uh, public comment for any matters not before the board tonight. Um, Go ahead and open that on up. Do we have anyone here for public comment? No. Um, so if anyone has a public comment, they would have to press the raise your hand um, item. Um, raise your hand feature, rather. Uh, I'm not seeing that. Um, all right. In that case, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, items. Uh, was it items not uh, anticipated within the next or within the 48 hours? Is that uh, what's that one called? Yeah, what? and I, I actually do have an item that I wanted to bring to your attention. And uh, I haven't had a chance to tell Steve yet. Um, so you're the first ones. Um, so the Lee, uh, regarding um, our application fees for the ZBA application, uh, while the fees themselves for the use it, are relatively inexpensive, you would say, you know, they're uh, maybe, um, you know, they range between $50 for owner occupied um, use applications such as like ADU and then for like a duplex it's about 225 and then for commercial uses are about $500 or um, things, things of that nature. So it's kind of based on the intensity of the use. But the legal ad, um, historically we've been, um, the fee is uh, the fee that the applicant pays is um, set at seventy-five dollars. Unfortunately, that does not 
come come at all close to what the real fee is to the Gazette. Um, um, it's often several. Uh, it's often maybe um, like four hundred dollars per per application. And so the planning department has been sort of subsidizing these legal fees. Um, and the planning department is sort of in the red um, right now um, because we've been doing that um, for uh, quite a bit now. So the planning director would like to um, experiment with the legal fees and starting July 1st, she uh, and the planning board uh, will be having the applicant themselves pay the fee um, as as invoiced by the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and um, she's asking that the planning board, uh, that the ZBA um, try out this new system. Um, so the applicant would pay the true fee of the legal ad instead of just paying seventy five dollars. Um, and so we wanted to let you know that that's something that um, the planning department would like to pursue and see, you know what uh see how this could work is there uh, any action that we need to take no i don't think so she just wanted to make you aware of it that like so that maybe the application form might change um like so the form says like it's 75 dollars for the legal ad so I, I i will have i'll have to tinker with what that would say but i don't think you need to make a motion but <laughs> if you have any thoughts um either now or in the future let let us know do we set that fee or does the planning department set that fee? Um, I'm not exactly sure. It might, um, I, I, I'll have to look into that. Okay. Um, yeah, well, keep us posted. Um, anything else before uh, we make a motion for adjournment? So the Sunset Ave application, which I think everyone here except for Eric is on that case panel. Um, and so that's being continued until um, June to the next meeting, which is June the 23rd. And, um, and then we have one other public hearing. Um, let's see, I think I have it somewhere, hold on a second, uh, which is um, for a, a non-owner occupied duplex to be located at 80 Pine Street. And just for the convenience of folks being there already for Sunset Ave, I'm gonna ask that um, members that are there for Sunset to stay on for um, the 80 Pine Street. And I can send that in an email. So if there's any sort of um, you know, issues with availability or uh, perhaps like a conflict of interest or something, um, please let me know. But I'll, I'll, send you, I'll send you all an email tomorrow indicating that. And then perhaps um, tonight's item for 77 North Whitney Street, if, if, if the applicant um, can produce those updated plans in time, uh, we, we can add that to the agenda as well for June 23rd. Got it. All right, uh, anything else? That's it. All right, uh, well, that being said, thank you all for uh, bearing with me for a little bit of long-winded sharing there. Uh, Eric, what do you got? Oh, no, I'm just, I was just waving goodbye. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I know we're all there. coming a bit to get out of here. We've still got to move to adjourn. Do I have such a motion? Oh, right. So move. Do I have a second? Second. All right. No discussion of the motion. Uh, Going to go, uh, Eric. Aye. Aye. Uh, Miss Parks. Aye. Meadows. Aye. John. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. 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 Thank you. Right. I know we are adjourned at 8.21. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Well done, Dylan. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Good job, Dylan. Yeah.